Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we celebrate Nuclear Hot Seat's fourth anniversary. Four! Yes, four years of weekly programs. Who'd have thunk it? And we do so by taking a look back at how the show evolved and where it's going. There will also be interviews with Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders on the March for the Children that is just concluding today, meant to raise awareness about the dangers at Pilgrim Nuclear Generating Station in Massachusetts. We will also hear from Erica Gray of the Virginia Sierra Club on a truly numbnuts plan to use North Anna Nuclear Generating Station, a nuke in an earthquake zone, as a test site for dry cask storage of high burn-up spent fuel. What could go wrong? Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shoutouts, and more nuclear information than I knew four years ago. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 16, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. This one strikes a little too close to home. According to EnviroReporter.com and its extremely reliable reporter, Michael Collins, air radiation analysis for Southern California shows a significant uptick in alpha and beta radiation, according to dust analysis completed on June 1st. Results show radiation registering at 325.7% of background levels. EnviroReporter.com has not found such a high degree of alpha in its sampling in thousands of previous tests conducted over the last four years. While alpha radiation can be stopped by a piece of paper or plastic, if it is brought into the body by food, water, or breathing, it is between 20 to 1,000 times more dangerous than beta or gamma radiation to the human organism due to its relative biological effectiveness in causing cell death and cancer. If you're in L.A. and you've got a HEPA filter, use it. Juicy article in Stars and Stripes reporting that members of a U.S. House of Representatives panel said on Friday, June 12, that they are frustrated with decades of security and safety lapses at some of the laboratories, manufacturing facilities, and other sites that make up the nation's nuclear complex. During a hearing in Washington, D.C., the lawmakers pushed top officials with the U.S. Energy Department and the National Nuclear Safety Administration for details on exactly how the agencies plan to revamp oversight of the contractors that run the facility. I think they meant supervision. Oversight is when you don't see something. The hearing focused on failures that contributed to the 2014 radiation release that forced the indefinite closure of the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the nation's only underground nuclear waste repository. Members of the panel also pointed to the disappearance of classified computers at Los Alamos in 2004 and the 2012 break-in at one of the nation's most secure sites, Y-12, by an 82-year-old nun and fellow activist. Go, Sister Megan. It gets better. U.S. Representative Chris Collins, a Republican from New York, said taxpayers are on the hook for the mistakes made at Los Alamos and the repository, and he wanted to know why no one was fired. Had something like that happened in the private sector, he said those responsible would have lost their jobs and the contractor would have been sued to recoup the cost of the damages. Congress doing its job. What a concept. So what's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doing? It's downsizing. Yes, the agency regulating nuclear power is planning to cut employees in an effort to better meet the new needs of the industry and regulators. So where we can't trust officials, the citizens are taking over. The Radiation Monitoring Project is a national initiative to establish monitoring of radioactivity in communities contaminated by the nuclear fuel chain. The project is a collaborative effort between Diné No Nukes of the Southwest Region, Nuclear Energy Information Service located in Chicago, and Sloths Against Nuclear State based in Brooklyn. 
The organizations are working together to establish mechanisms to monitor radioactivity and the means to access the information online. And the good news is that they are attempting to raise $15,000, and they received $8,000 in a single anonymous donation. We'll have a link up on the website if you wish to donate to them. Diane Turco is one of the founders of Cape Cod Downwinders, which focuses on raising awareness regarding the ongoing issues at the Pilgrim Nuclear Facility in Massachusetts. We spoke on Monday, June 15, when she was in the middle of a four-day protest march from Cape Cod to the Massachusetts State House in Boston to bring attention to the lack of feasible public safety planning in Cape Cod and Massachusetts and to raise awareness of the risks they face to those who live in the danger zone. Diane Turco. Welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. You're currently involved with an event called the March for Our Children. Would you please describe what it is and how it came about? Well, it was actually the brainchild of John Gawley, who is with Occupy Kingham in the Glastonbury Abbey. And he wanted to raise awareness in the South Shore area because he was disturbed that people in the uh, immediate danger zone around Pilgrim didn't even understand that it was a danger zone. So he called uh, Cape Town Winter to join him and plan this event. We were marching from, well, we, we marched, actually. We started with the town of Plymouth and Kingston. The second day we moved on to Pembroke, Duxbury, Marshfield and Situate. And today it was Situate, Cohasset and Hingham, and tomorrow... Weymouth, Braintree, up to Boston. And we'll be ending at the State House with our rally with former Governor Michael Dukakis speaking, along with our wonderful State Senator, uh, Dan Wolf, uh, Paul Hunter from Beyond Nuclear, and Subrata Goshroy, who's with the International Network of Engineers for Global Responsibility. What has been the response along the way? Have you stopped and had conversations? Have there been little speak-outs or teach-ins? How have you been carrying the information forward in a visible way? We have postcards that we're handing to folks as we walk by them to talk about how they are in an emergency zone and how the state and NRC call it an emergency planning zone, but we're actually renaming it to what it really is. It's a contamination relocation zone. And a lot of young people, we found in Plymouth, a lot of young people came up to us and didn't even know much about Pilgrim. They weren't even sure what we were protesting. So we were able to engage these young folks, and we've got quite a few names and contacts now to follow through with more education. I always believe that changing languaging around an issue is one of the best ways to make points, to move it out of the cliches and the ruts of people's thinking. What has been the response when you told people that they are in a contamination and relocation zone as regards to the nuclear power plant? First of all, it really indicates that there is no safe way to be exposed to radioactive materials. I mean, we all know that radiation causes cancer. And the state calls it an evacuation zone. We know there's not going to be a very good chance of evacuating given the population, the roads. And as we know today, everybody will hear about it on their phone, so the roads will be jammed. So we also acknowledge, too, that the state has determined that people on Cape Cod would not evacuate because we only have two bridges. They'll be shutting those down. So they have acknowledged that we will be contaminated by giving us potassium iodide outside of the 10-mile emergency planning zone, as they call it, and then they will relocate us. So what we understand is that the state plans are people will be contaminated, and then they will be relocated. So let's take that emergency planning and sheltering language and really make it real. So it's shelter in place. You're going to be contaminated. Oh, well, that's you. And not really making any solid or believable plans for protecting people, let alone the environment. Well, you know, sheltering in place is one of the uh, emergency procedures in the event of a radiological accident within the 10 miles, and that's what we're being told within the 50 miles where I live. But if you go to the Massachusetts Emergency Management page and on the emergency plan, does have a whole paragraph on shelter in place. So when you think shelter in place, you think, oh, nice and cozy, I'll have my blanket and pillow and a container of food or whatever. And actually, they identify that shelter in place only provides protection for only two hours. That's no protection. Wow. I hadn't documented in the plan, yeah. 
I hadn't heard that one before. I do recall someone I knew who was involved with military and other planning like that, and mm-hmm. he said that shelter in place was actually designed so that dead bodies were not strewn all around the place. They would just stay nicely in the building. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Well, you can look this up on the uh, Massachusetts Emergency website, and it states right there, two hours. So getting back to the march itself, have you had any children mm-hmm. on the march? No, we are marching for the children. What has the media coverage been like regarding the march? You know what? Our goal was to raise awareness in the South Shore, and every day there have been reports in the local newspapers about the march. And tomorrow we're looking at more global news coverage because we'll be in Boston at the State House with former Governor Michael Dukakis speaking. What can people do in making this even more effective than it already has been? There were a few things. One is we were asking Governor Baker to call on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to revoke the operating license of Pilgrim Nuclear because public safety cannot be assured. Um, Again, we're saying the only way to be assured of safety is not to be exposed to radiation. Secondly, we're asking the governor to not approve the mass emergency plan that won't protect the public. You know, it's it's, it's quite a facade. Um, So we're asking those two things. The third thing we're asking people to is come and join us. We are now on Massachusetts Downwinders, madownwinders.org is our website. Join us in this fight to close Pilgrim because democracy is a verb. And we need to get out on the streets. We need to make a lot of noise. And we need to gather together to call for the closing of Pilgrim. So in other words, get off Facebook. Take your phones with so that you can stay in touch with Twitter. And Mm -hmm. join the action, lend your bodies to support so that there is a visible turnout as well as the emotional and philosophically supportive turnout that you get with digital media. Absolutely, absolutely. As as Ralph Nader said, in democracy, you have to show up. Well, here's to a great number of people joining us. Thank you for showing up and all of the others with our best wishes, and stay in touch. Let us know what's happening up in Massachusetts with Pilgrim for Nuclear Hot Seat. We do. Thank you, Libby. Diane Turco of Cape Cod Downwinders. Here's hoping that today's Massachusetts State House rally pulled media coverage, good crowds, and the attention of that state's politicians. Over to Japan, where the government and Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, have obviously been working with focus groups in order to figure out their talking points regarding Fukushima. They just announced that the disaster mitigation at Fukushima Daiichi, which they laughingly referred to as decommissioning, is being shifted to a policy focused on reducing risks rather than speedy operations in order to prevent negative impact on, get the phrase, people and the environment. Yeah, and now they're feeding their workers hot meals from locally sourced ingredients. Mm -mm -mm. Meanwhile, Banyan Analytics, an institute that assists the U.S. government in developing strong emergency preparedness and response systems in the Asia-Pacific area, has issued a report stating that few issues in the Asia-Pacific security horizon are more worrying and potentially more destabilizing to the region than the decommissioning and cleanup of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The situation is dangerous enough that a single mistake could potentially lead to a radiologic disaster far worse than the initial disaster. The report states, The situation in Fukushima is so fragile that a number of things could go wrong at any moment to make the currently risky situation turn globally catastrophic. Support for Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe baby has fallen to the lowest level since he took office in 2012, to just over 40 percent. And over the weekend, 10,000 people turned out to rally against him near Parliament on Saturday, and 25,000 got together on Sunday. The protesters oppose his policies on violating the Japanese Constitution and his push to restart the nuclear reactors. 6,500 people from Futuba, the evacuated town that used to co-host the Fukushima nuclear power plant, are asking that two major signboards extolling the future of nuclear power be preserved as a testament to the myth of nuclear safety. Among the slogans they want to preserve, Nuclear power is the energy of a bright future. Arbeit macht frei. 
Internationally, the Canadian government has announced that their decision on whether or not to approve the $1 billion Kincardine nuclear waste storage facility, less than one mile from the shores of Lake Huron, will be postponed until after elections in the fall. Don't want their decision influencing the elections, now do they? Opposition to this waste dump keeps growing. U.S. Senator Mark Kirk, a Republican of Illinois, has called for President Obama to do something to protect the Great Lakes, saying what common sense would lead most people to say, which is, storing nuclear waste underground along the shores of the Great Lakes directly jeopardizes the well-being of this shared natural resource. And I urge the president to work with the Canadian government to postpone this decision and protect our lakes for generations to come. This from a Republican to President Obama. You know the situation's bad if you get that kind of action going. In Belarus, a large forest fire has been reported near Gomel, which is 132 kilometers or 82 miles from Chernobyl. In the nearby village of Zhoniki, everyone is reported to be staying indoors because there are high levels of radiation. And now... Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. None nuts of the week. This is actually from last week, but it is too good to not use. Amber Rudd, the UK's new Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, says new major infrastructure projects should be pretty, they should be aesthetically pleasing, and that includes nukes. She actually said, We're hoping to build new nuclear plants in the UK over the next few years, and I think it is a reasonable ambition to make sure that these big projects have aesthetic appeal as well, to help win over the public. Lady, Dr. Ian Fairley's work shows that leukemia rates go up in proximity to nuclear reactors. We've all seen pictures of the horrible transgenerational mutations taking place one, two, and now three generations after Chernobyl. Plutonium-laced, not-quite-spent fuel rods remain toxic for literally tens of thousands of years. There is nothing pretty or aesthetically pleasing about anything to do with nuclear. And that's why, Amber Rudd, with a great big Amber Alert, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Let's get right into the week's features. Just in time for this week's show, World Nuclear News, that PR mouthpiece for the nuclear industry, put out an article headlined, The State of Virginia Has the Potential to Be a Nuclear Energy Leader in the USA and sent it out under the headline, Virginia Can Lead the Nation's Nuclear Renaissance. Now, the R word in connection with nuclear has been long discredited because it's like the anti-Renaissance. It's been going backwards for a long time. So, Sisyphus, you're not going to get that rock up that hill. And this article is based entirely on a position paper published by the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy. Sounds really official, doesn't it? But if you scratch the surface, the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy is just a right-wing libertarian quote-unquote think tank funded by the Koch brothers. So really, this is the equivalent of a pro-nuclear PR agency writing policy reports and shoving it down the throats and up the other places of legislators in Virginia and elsewhere around the country. Well, as they say in my neck of the woods, Two, two, two on that. To get the real story of what's going on in Virginia, even before this article came out, we spoke with Erica Gray. She is the Nuclear Issues Chair for the Virginia Sierra Club and keeps a close eye on what's happening with Dominion Power's two nuclear reactor facility at North Anna in Virginia. As a reminder, North Anna was only 11 miles from the epicenter of the 2011 5.8 earthquake on the East Coast. And there's still a lot of questions about the soundness of that facility. So here's some information on North Anna that you can trust. Erica Gray, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Uh, be for having me on. Let's start out with you telling listeners a bit about the work that you do within our movement. 
Well, I'm here in Virginia, and I am on the Sierra Club Virginia chapter board. I am their nuclear chairs issue person. I'm kind of like the watchdog for North Anna Nuclear Power Station that's in Louisa, Virginia. And I do kind of keep an eye on the Surrey plant as well down in Surrey, Virginia. And basically watch things uh, all nuclear as it comes to uh, deals with the energy issues. I know that I cite you regularly on the program because you are the source of the updates on what the NRC is saying with their accident reports of what went wrong with nuclear reactors this week. And I really appreciate what you do to make that information easily visible and accessible to those of us in the movement who may not be keeping our eye on that particular stream of information. Unfortunately, I've been bugging the NRC for years to update Uh, on their website, the events report, uh, seven days a week, but they only do it five days a week, and then they take holidays and weekends off. So uh, typically on Monday morning, um, usually there's a a longer list of the things that have happened over the weekend. So, yeah, I can't help but track it because besides tracking my own facilities here, uh, which uh, I'm about 32 miles downwind from North Anna and maybe 45 miles or so away from upwind from Surrey, But, of course, I have family and friends all over the United States that are concerned with their power stations. So, you know, when I post these events, it's whatever's happened anywhere in the United States dealing with those reactors. You also keep your eye on other issues and recently brought to my attention an item about sister fuel rods as regards the state of Idaho. Could you first explain to us what these sibling, these sister fuel rods are? In April 2013, the the U.S. Department of Energy announced a $16 million a year award for a team led by Electric Power Research Institute called EPRI to conduct a high burn-up fuel cast research and development project. The EPRI team includes Areva Federal Services, Transnuclear International, Dominion Virginia Power, Areva Fuels, and Westinghouse Fuels. And the objective of the demonstration is to observe and confirm the long-term characteristics and behaviors of high burn-up fuel under real conditions in a full-scale dry storage system. What Dominion volunteered us here in Virginia to be is the test site for this brand-new cask uh, that would hold this high burn-up fuel at North Anna. And, of course, if you remember back in 2011 when Virginia had an unprecedented 5.8 earthquake, uh, it was 11 miles from North Anna Nuclear Power Station that knocked down both the facilities, uh, both the reactors, and was offline for uh, a couple of months. When they were allowed back online, it was a relatively short period of time, and they had only done examination, close examination, or as close as they could, of the underground piping of one of the plants that that's okay, if it's good for one, it's good for the other, and they put both plants online. So there were a lot of objections at the time and questions about the safety of bringing them both back online. Yes, exactly. Uh, Paul Gunter uh, with Beyond Nuclear and some folks with Not on Our Fault Line, APV, the Alliance for Progressive Values, and, uh, of course, I was part of the team, we filed a 2.206 to not allow them to restart because of a lot of issues, not just because they weren't going to check more of the piping, but, I mean, we had missing seismic sensors. We had them in the wrong positions, in the wrong locations. I mean, there was a lot of different issues. But, of course, you know, they kind of just, you know, overrode it and went ahead and started back up the facility. Of course, the reason why you know, talking about these sister rods in this dry cast experiment, kind of crazy to think that Dominion's volunteered us to be this test site because they want to put this test cast on the pad there at North Anna where 25 of the 27 vertical casts move some up to four and a half inches during our earthquake. So, I mean, the area is not stable. Um, it's actually that area is considered, it's called the Central Virginia Seismic Zone. And the longer time goes by, we find that there's multiple fault lines. Essentially, it's a very bad location for the two reactors already, but to think that we're going to do a test cast, it hasn't been done really ever for high burn-up fuel. 
they're going back to the sister rods, this plan they have, mind you, Dominion still, and I've been told they're going to file for an amendment for their fuel storage facility license. They need to file for an amendment to be able to do this test site. So even though everything's moving forward really quickly with this test plan, Dominion still hasn't officially got the amendment to do it. You know, the NRC and EPRI made this plan up and got it going before they even got the amendment, which is kind of typical of how they put the cart before the horse. Why don't you explain to us what this harebrained scheme is that they have come up with that they are trying to implement? Dominion is going to extract 25 rods, and they're calling them sister rods, and ship them to Idaho Laboratory where they will be examining these rods. They've been in the pools. They'll put it into a cask and ship it to Idaho, and they'll sit there and they'll examine them and hold on to them. And at the same time, they're supposed to be moving forward, which they're thinking in about a year, Dominion will be putting the four different samples of rods, because there's various rods that are in the reactor, because over the years they would, you know, come up with new rods, new cladding, you know, a little bit different fuel and then put them in the experimental cask. And that's the cask they want to put onto the pad there at North Anna. Then this cask, it's essentially a transnuclear 32 cask. The only difference will be is it'll have um, more monitoring availability on the lid. And it'll have coupling that can, for temperature gauging of the rods inside the cask. And then they'll put the cask on the pad and let it sit there for about 10 years and keep checking on it, supposedly. And then they want to pack it up and ship it again, probably to Idaho or to another facility, to open up the cask and examine it after it had been sitting there for so long and after it had been transported, which is really kind of crazy because preliminary data coming out already on high burn-up is the fuel has been more enriched, so it burns hotter, it stays in the reactor longer, and it's um, more susceptible to cracks, corrosion, and breakage. And so there's definitely a lot of worry with that. You know, I I couldn't understand at first, like, why did Dominion volunteer us? But then in doing research, I found that they were the ones, because only one dry cask has ever been opened up and examined. Again, it was Virginia Dominion Power, and... It was done in 2000, and I think the experiment actually, when they started, was 1999. So let's walk through what it is that Dominion is planning. First of all, they have this cask. This is a cask that has not been used before in the United States, or has it been used in other no. countries? No, actually, it's the transnuclear ones that they use now. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of modifications other than the lid's going to be modified to have a little more ability to monitor the gases, and couplings are going to be attached to the assembly so they can monitor for heat. So it's uh, one of these vertical designs. So I don't think it's a lot different than what they're using right now. So it's slightly modified. Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety has done a lot of research into high burn-up fuel and dry cask storage, and she refers to the thin canisters, the thin casks. I refer to them more as tin cans, but <laughs> she she speaks about the ones that are being proposed here by Southern California Edison for the San Onofre waste that are already in use up in Diablo Canyon, which are only five sixteenths of an inch thick and they have no ability to monitor the contents. There's no ability to figure out if there is any leakage or not, and if they do leak, there's no way to fix them. From what you're saying, this canister they want to do the test on has some minor modifications in terms of monitoring the content, but are we still talking about the 5 sixteenths of an inch of thickness for the canister itself being the only thing between us and all of that highly radioactive spent but not really spent fuel. Right. 
Well, you know, as it comes to the cast design, exactly, because um, I've been on a call before with Don in California and me in Virginia, and we were on the call with the NRC, you know, talking about high burnout fuel storage. The difference is, the TN32 is different from the Holtec, I guess, cast that they use in California. To find out that it seems that uh, reactors around the country have different types of fuel. So Dominion is um, really focusing only on the types of fuel that we have here. So it, it really won't pertain, you know, the, the, the whole cast system and the test really won't show what the other fuel types are going to look like. Donna's obviously done a you know a great job on really getting down to the nitty gritties of exactly how the casks are designed. I haven't spent quite as much time on that, uh, other than to know that you know the, the 27 vertical casks that are on the pad now don't have the couplings and don't have the special lid that's going to be attached for more monitoring of the cask and of the contents. But it still doesn't make me feel any better because. Uh, essentially, you know, we're talking about a difference of fuel types and the high burnout being a lot hotter and pretty much just putting it in the same, like you said, tin can and uh, hoping for the best. As it goes for that very first and only dry cast that was ever opened, was opened in 1999-2000 range, it was a Caster V21, and it was actually shipped from Surrey. And they said, oh, it looked fine, no problem. So really only one canister cast, dry cask, has ever been open since we've been putting spent nuclear fuel in these casks. And how long had the fuel actually been in there when they checked? Well, it looked like it was in there for 15 years. Which is, of course, nothing compared to how long it's going to take for this stuff to go flat. How long are they approved for? Because with the whole tech canisters, I believe the NRC will only approve them for 20 years, and that means we're going to need a whole new set of tasks in 20 years. How long are they proposing that the one they're testing now would be good for if it proves out? Well, you know, they've seen everything on what transpired last year with the waste confidence ruling. And fuel can stay on site 120 years or maybe indefinitely. Uh, and they've already said that they think the casks are fine. But this <laughs> kind of proves it's not fine because they are worried they might not last. The reason why we're doing this test cask at North Anna for high burnout fuel, because we really just don't know. It's just guessing and hoping as we pray. <laughs> so, <I> mean, <laughs> here in Virginia, we formed a coalition where we are going to have to ask for a hearing but ironically, they won't give me a date when this amendment that Dominion has to put forth, they're saying, oh, it's probably going to be in July. I said, well, can someone contact me so I can know when that is and so I can read the document? And they said, oh, well, no, we can't do that. You'll just have to keep an eye and see when the docket hits. And I'm like, oh. oh. You know, that's like a con person saying, trust me. <laughs> this is a ludicrous situation. So. When you say they need to get an amendment, who do they need to get an amendment from? They need to file an application for an amendment for their dry cast storage pad, their facility, their independent storage facility, because this will be different than what they already have there. And so there's an amendment they need to file, and the NRC needs to approve it. So what they want to do, is take one of these casks, stuff it full of high burn-up fuel, spent fuel rods that have come through the years, and keep it on site in North Anna, and then somewhere 10 years down the line take it to Idaho to open it up? Correct. Why take it to Idaho? Well, from what I understand, they actually are going to probably have to build a facility to be able to open it. That one call that uh, Donna and I were both on, it kind of made it sound like they didn't even have the facility ready to be able to open a canister. I imagine it's going to be pretty lethal when they want to go open it up, especially if, you know, if it's damaged or something. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns with this, and there definitely needs to be a lot more clarity that needs to come forward. But the idea is 
leave it on the pad and be checking for the gases. Now, I was told by an NRC, Mark Lombard, which Donna also knows and speaks with, he ended up telling me, well, you know, you know, after 10 years, they might not need to open it. <laughs> like, In other words, what? they're going to put together this experiment, but then they're going to call off the experiment and say, ah, we're better off not knowing. Yeah, no, it looks fine, you know, no no need to really open it, I guess, is their take on it. It's really kind of crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And, and, you know, obviously here, I mean, after our earthquake, we've had way over 450 aftershocks. And, uh, you know, I think we've had like six. I mean, not as large as the 5.8, mind you, uh, but six within the past year. And, of course, they're all located up there by North Anna. Definitely unnerving, to say the least. So what is the best possible route to be taken by this activist coalition as regards what seems to be a ramrod of this ill-conceived experiment that may turn out to be not even an experiment 10 years from now if they decide not to open the cask? I think our first and most important thing is, you know, once we can find out for sure when that docket's going to hit or when it hit is we need to file for a hearing because when I asked if, you know, when the hearing is going to be for when this amendment comes up, they said, oh, well, there's no mandatory hearing. But you can ask for one. You can request one. So we're going to ask for a hearing uh, because that will at least shine some light on it because most Virginians aren't quite aware of what's going on up there. I think our earthquake did wake up a lot of people. But that's going to be our number one thing, that that our first thing that we need to do to ask for a hearing, and that will hopefully also bring in some media and will also help shine some light on this. And it's not just that it's not an experiment. I mean, we are talking about putting four different types of cladding and rods together in one cask, and it's all high burn-up fuel and putting it on a pad where there's 27 other casts. I don't know what could happen. And, and frankly, I don't think they really know what can happen either. So it's an experiment all the way around. But you're right. They might look at it and say, well, the gas levels look fine. The heat level, you know, it's fine. We don't need to do anything. It looks great. Yeah, carry on. These casts are fine, you know, to store the fuel in and definitely and transport it. I mean, you know, it's, it's really ridiculous. Right. So they're talking about high burn up fuel of various sorts, mixed sorts in the same canister, having it in what is already a proven earthquake zone in proximity with at least 27 other canisters, 25 of which are known to have moved during the last earthquake. And then maybe 10 years down the line, we face a mobile Chernobyl of the transport of the calf to Idaho, where a facility has not yet been built that's going to have to be safe for the opening of this highly radioactive material-containing cask, if they even build it at all, unless they look at it and go, eh, it looks good, it must be good, and they turn their backs on it, hoping that the rest of us have stopped paying attention to it. Exactly. I mean, mind you, you know, if Idaho allows the shipment of the 25 sister rods, we already got mobile to noble. I mean, that means that they'll be taking the 25 rods and sending them on the road down to Idaho for them to hold on to and for them to examine them. And that way, if they decide to go forward and actually open up that cast, they'll say, okay, well, these rods, they looked like this, you know, 10 years ago and were transported and now this cask has been transported, and it looks like this. So it's really the sister rods are really for them to have some sort of comparison. But they still would be shipped. But, yeah, obviously it kind of opens the door for them to really start shipping this stuff around. Well, I can't tell you how happy I am that activists with the dedication and the awareness and the tenacity such as yourself are on this because if there's going to be any truth and any safety implemented in the course of this, any, quite frankly, from my perspective, sanity, it's going to have to come from the pressure of people such as yourself and those with whom you are in coalition to smack these people silly about the risk they are putting us to 
and the fact that they haven't thought this out completely yet. No, they haven't. I mean, obviously, Dominion won't state exactly how much money they're being paid to be part of this project, and they haven't been forthcoming to Virginia citizens because I asked before. I said, okay, well, so who's approved this project? Has the governor? You know, has our attorney general? I mean, you know, who's it? And I can't get an answer. It, you know, it seems like the Department of Energy and the NRC and Dominion are running the show. Virginians have had no say in if this project goes forward or not. They just seem to be kind of just rolling it on out. You know, there's already, just like most of these nuclear power plants around the country, they're old and getting rickety, and every day there is some problem or something's breaking. And past year we had a couple of broken spent fuel rods when they removed them from the reactor during refueling. We have an ongoing tritium leak. It's on site, like they call it, in the protected area. Protected in what way and for who and from who? (laughs) Exactly. Well, basically, it's kind of ridiculous because, you know, it's just not outside the perimeters of the facility. But still, I mean, we're talking about groundwater uh, contamination. But this has been going on now for years um, with the levels reaching, you know, three times the EPA acceptable levels uh, in water, in drinking water. So they can't find the problem. And so, you know, of course, I have absolutely no confidence in us moving forward with an experiment when they can't seem to manage to even find the leak that we have ongoing now for years. So, yeah, I'm very concerned. It inspires me to keep on, and I read a lot of documents to go to a lot of different meetings. And as much as I can find um, and share with others and in our coalition so that, you know, we can hopefully – get our governor and elected officials aware of what's going on, because in all this mix, Libby, they have still got that proposal for a third nuclear reactor at North Anna. And Mr. Wheatley of Dominion Power has already stated this past year at the legislative session that this new reactor that has never been built or commercially operated anywhere in the world, it only exists on paper, It would cost more than $10 billion and take over a decade to build. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what could we do that's so much safer and doesn't produce more nuclear waste and wouldn't endanger our lives with that much money and effort and time? I've been told before when I've mentioned to the NRC, well, why would we want to put another reactor where it's in our seismic zone where the other two reactors have been knocked offline? And the Dominion representative said, oh, well, don't worry, Erica. This new facility is going to be two times as strong as the other two reactors. I said, oh, well, what good is that if Unit 1 or Unit 2 go down in our next earthquake? And then we got Unit 3 there. I mean, well, it, it won't be of any good. I think we're, it would be really wrong for us to put all our eggs in, the, in one basket and, and then have – you know, three reactors at North Anna. So, you know, there's multiple things that we are fighting here. We're fighting against a third reactor. We're trying to push that they have to fix the leak, a tritium leak there, and we're fighting this demonstration experimental cast that they want to do at North Anna as well. It's multi-issued here, but, yeah, I can't help but uh, be involved. Well, I'm glad that you are. I hope to be able to find some reporter in your area who really would be interested in landing a Pulitzer because this is a huge story that deserves really in-depth reporting on it. Erica, it's great to know that you and the others down there are on the job and on point with this, and do keep us informed so that we can pass word on to other listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Well, Libby, it's been a pleasure, and let me say, I love your program. I listen to it every week, and you do a marvelous job. Thank you so much for the work you do. It's so important, timely, and just love it. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Erica Gray, Nuclear Issues Chair for the Virginia Sierra Club. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep this show up and running. So if you wish to donate or maybe send us an anniversary present, hint, hint, 
You can go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, click on the big red Donate button, and knock yourself out. Know that anything you can do to help support us is really deeply appreciated. Here's today's activist shout-out combined with the final thought. Four years of nuclear hot seat every week? Who'd have thunk it? But it was four years ago, during an unplugged retreat to the mountains, that I got the hit to do a podcast on nuclear issues. The following Tuesday, despite my resistance, I posted a single notice on Facebook for a conference call, and when I got on the line, two other people were there. I am eternally grateful to you, Tim and Wanda, for the support that you gave me that day. Here are a few snippets of where I was and what that first call, no title, not even a real show yet, was like. Okay, here we go, guys. Um, My name is Libby Halevi, and we are talking on Tuesday, June 14th, 2011. And uh, the purpose of this call is to discuss the nuclear issues that are going on in the world. Um, Since Fukushima, on March 11th of this year, uh, I have been absorbed in what's going on, the information that's out there, the various ramifications it's having, the lack of information that is getting to most people, and what it is that we need to do in order to maintain our health, maintain our sanity, and do something to turn around the nuclear situation so that we're no longer being um, subjected to the dangers of having a dirty bomb in our backyard. This is about sparking an activist response. Um, A lot of times online we get all excited and we sign petitions and we forward videos and we say, oh, look at this, oh, isn't isn't this upsetting, oh, isn't this terrible? And then it all dies down and goes away, and nothing has translated into action in the analog world, in the physical world. It's just been a brouhaha online. So what I would like to do is address this from a perspective of what can we do to take action, small steps leading to larger steps, that can put an activist response into the world so we can start turning this thing around. I need to add that at the time, I was not in touch with a larger activist community. I had no one in my life who wanted to discuss the nuclear issue at all. Here's something that was on my mind in a much deeper way. So what this speaks to to me and the thing that has haunted me from the start is that I believe that in all honesty the nature of life on Earth just changed. Yeah. I believe... And it scares me to even say this and put this out, but this is what has been haunting me, and I I need to get it out there, that we live in a time that a science fiction book would refer to as that time when everything had already changed, only people were too scared, too ignorant, or too arrogant to understand, and they pretended and acted as if everything was still normal when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to do this. I don't even know what this is, but I'm willing to hang out with the process, make it available, make it a little more visible next time around maybe, Uh and um, do my little bit. Do my one person a day. Do my no ice in my drinks. And whatever else I can do to get the word out and help raise people's awareness that we do not need to panic, we do need to act. And by admitting to the fear and turning around and finding one small thing to do every day, we will begin the process of empowerment and change. It's been scary being alone with this and not being able to engage in the conversation, and that stopped me from taking action. And um, you've just helped me alleviate the part that had me stuck. So here's two more action, and um, let's start turning this around. One tiny action at a time, but if we all take it, it's amazing what we'll be able to do. You did a beautiful job. Thank you. I'm actually going to post a link for this as soon as I figure out how to do that. (laughs) 
me, me and my techie, my, my, my boomer techie Luddite uh, uh, behavior. Well, I didn't stay a techie Luddite for long. And I didn't know what this thing was that I was doing. And because of that, it kept changing. At first, I didn't know how to post the show as a podcast. And it was just a conference call done live at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. During interviews, I would open up the lines for questions from the listeners with the following results. Well, I'd like to open this up for uh, Q&A. If there's anybody in the listening audience who has a particular question, we're talking with Kevin Camps, uh, who's the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, and uh, he's been opening our eyes to a lot of very important information to consider. So if anybody's got a question, jump in now. Many lurkers. I'm wondering if any of the uh, listeners on the podcast would like to ask Michael a question. Let's find out if there's anybody on the line who can actually get through to ask a, a question of Michael Keegan, who is the chair of Nuclear Free Great Lakes. Uh, does anybody have a question for him? I could go on, but you get the idea. It didn't matter who I had on the line or what we were discussing. I came to realize that the last thing anyone was reliably going to do is jump on the line and ask a question of my interviewee at 4 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon Pacific time. So that feature got dropped. Then somewhere along the line, I was unable to do a live interview, so I recorded one. And that gave me the freedom and flexibility to record interviews whenever someone was available. Pre- and post-production were born. The sarcasm took some time. At first, I'd say something snarky and then edit it out, thinking, this is nuclear. This is serious. Who am I to be cracking jokes about it? But the early shows were often so grim that I couldn't listen to them. So sometimes I let a bit of snark through, and that's what people responded to. So pardon what I refer to affectionately as my anti-nuclear Tourette syndrome, but sometimes it feels like a good pun is the only way I can get through a story. Originally, each episode of Nuclear Hot Seat started with me reading the same intro material. Then one day, I read someone's post online saying that the sirens at San Onofre Nuclear Power Station had gone off. And my first thought was, sirens? They've got sirens? So I called the PR department at San Onofre, and they actually sent me a direct link to the audio which led to this being the show's opening. That is the sound you never want to hear. It is the sound of a warning siren going off at a nuclear power plant. But whether you can hear that sound or not, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Well, that was an annoying bit of doom and gloom. No need to gild that particular lily. So I started hunting around for something else to start the show with. And I used to write musicals, and I'd been humming the start of what I thought would be a good theme song in my head. Fortunately, among my circle of friends are many professional musicians, including Marilee Weber, looks like Weber, sounds like Weber, who stepped in to take this little ditty that was buzzing around in my brain and arrange it a la Andrews Sisters in three-part girl group harmony. Then she recorded them in multiple voiceover. She even strong-armed her husband, pianist John Barnard, into playing along with it. And it was a real strong-arm tactic because at the time, he was pro-nuclear. I think he's come around by now. We professionally recorded the song at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood with producer-owner Craig Parker Adams, another supporter of this show. We did it just in time, too, because the next show, the first one to have this theme, featured Arnie Gunderson being interviewed on what he would do were he in charge at Fukushima, along with the announcement of Japan winning the 2020 Olympics for Tokyo. A perfect storm of a program that led to almost half a million downloads in a week. This is still the record. As I look back over these four years, the journey has been remarkable. With the help of you, the listeners, I've been able to travel to events to bring back special reports. Dr. Helen Caldicott's two New York symposia, one on Fukushima and the other on nuclear weapons, the Uranium Film Festival and World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City, Coalition Against Nukes Rally in Washington, D.C., 
and panel discussions with Ralph Nader in New York and at the Massachusetts State House, as well as all kinds of goings on up and down the coast of California. Our reach has been extended with the help of many friends. On April 8th of 2013, we began to be syndicated online by UCY.TV. And with their help, in May alone of this year, Nuclear Hot Seat was listened to in 58 countries on six continents. No penguins yet. We're still trying. But the fact of at least one English-speaking person in almost one-third of the planet's nations listen to this show is both thrilling and humbling. If I ever wondered about the show's effectiveness, we were hacked two years ago. And now this show and the interviews presented on them are being cited as source material in mainstream media reports. I have not managed to do this alone. Along the way, I have been helped by all of you who feed me tips, straighten me out when I make a mistake, suggest stories and guests, send me links, and otherwise cheer me on. And boy, you'll never know how much that means to me. To all of the interviewees, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being so gracious and generous in sharing your genuine expertise in our interviews, as well as everything you have done throughout your lives to gain that expertise. Regular behind-the-scenes helpers include Joni Ray, who helps me make videos of each week's audio program, and Scott Portsline, who helped me cut hours off the editing process when he explained audacity to me. Plus, there are all the activists out there who field my emergency Tuesday production day email saying, help, what does this really mean? And get back to me with such speed, good humor, generosity of spirit, and reliable facts. As we launch into year five, I have no idea what the half-life of nuclear hot seat is, though if I had my way, it would last at least as long as plutonium. Like I stated in nuclear hot seat number one, I don't even know exactly what this thing is that I'm doing, but I plan to keep doing it as long as I can, and it proves to be of use in the battle against nuclear. The nuclear hot seat mission statement is, Provide the news with the greatest accuracy possible. Provide context and continuity so people not only learn the week's facts, but have a way of understanding what they need. And keep the movement, this amazing community of fierce, funny, brave, and wonderful activists in good heart. As we move forward into year five and beyond, let me know how I'm doing. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 9, 2015. Material for this week's show has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, envirorreporter.com with Michael Collins, sputniknews.com, ft.com, Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine, Stars and Stripes, thehill.com. DineNoNukes.org, JapanNews.com, Banyan Analytics, ChinaDailyAsia.com, Asahi.com, Counterpunch.org, Informable.com, and Lucas Hickson, Coalition Against Nukes, WiseInternational.org, the PR hacks and flax of World Nuclear News, and the bright, brave, bold, and marvelous, simply marvelous, darling members of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com and iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, or on iTunes, and our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halabi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halabi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.